Okay, I think it is at least seven and we should get started. All right, so it's seven o'clock on the dot. So thank you for all of my on-time students and I'm sure everyone else will join us shortly. So thus far, we have gone through nine steps. We've only got another 30 to go. And we're taking you step-by-step step through how one teaches Chumash, specifically focused on how one teaches Rashi. And I hope over the past two weeks, you've been incorporating the techniques we've been learning and you're seeing the results. The results meaning the heightened interest in the part of the students, the heightened involvement, the heightened sense of ownership. All right, so let's continue. Up to step 10, the learner will identify all quotations within a Rashi. Now, the learner identifying quotations within a Rashi is a, a fairly simple skill, but we build tremendously on the skill, and therefore it definitely needs to be master. From what grade do the students start? From seventh. From what grade do you as the teacher show them? From sixth grade. Consistently from sixth grade, you constantly identify, oh, here's a quotation, here's a quotation, here's a quotation. Even if they don't understand the significance of quotations, they're absorbing this sense of identifying quotations. And if you do that consistently for a year, by the time they're in seventh grade, you can have the students do it. So let's be the students and do it. Yeah. All right, here's a Rashi in our park. Okay, okay. So underline the quotation on your own paper. If you want to open your Chumash, if you just want to jot down on paper, the quotation in this Rashi. And when you're done, you can sort of look at me. Of course, you can't because I'm seeing one's face. <laughs> Thank you, Aviv. If I can see your faces and you look at me, then I'll know you're done. Okay, Aviv is looking at me. So, let's see. All right. So here are my students, my seventh grade students. And I said to them, find the quotation. And hopefully they did. And if they didn't, and if they argue on it, let's go look it up. Very simple. Let's look it up in the parak and see. And surely this entire quote is a quotation. Let's do another one. All right. How many quotations are in this Rashi? This you can send me up as a chat. How many quotations are in this Rashi? send me up, read through the Rashi. I'm your teacher. You're my seventh grade class. You've been trained for a year, so you know the concept. How many quotations are in this Rashi? Now, if I was doing this with my class, obviously they're not sending me up checks. I would tell them, show me with your fingers. I often say, show me with your fingers. It's a very easy technique. Well, I'm not going to move on when I have, thank you very much, Hani, one participant that responded. <laughs> We're going to be a little more stubborn here. Read through the Rashi and identify everything that looks like a quotation and then send me up a number. And as I say to my students, worst case scenario, you're wrong. That's okay too.
we're, I'm not asking you to identify them. All we need now is a number. Which is what I would do with a class if there's more than one quotation. If there's one, I'm not going to like make a trick, but if there's more than one, I would generally say, show me with your fingers how many quotations you find. So actually, there are three. So thank you, Rabbi Shapiro, being our star student of the day. There are three, and now that you know there are three, um, identify them. And again, you could send them up to me, or really for the purpose of this exercise, you could just jot it down yourself. Because the idea is that you should know that you can find them. I am telling you there are three. Now find them. Okay. And we found them. Which, by the way, if you're going to bother to do a PowerPoint, this is such a fast, easy way of checking. Now, let me ask you, from my limited responses, why did I get twos and only one three? Which was a quotation that messed people up? You could tell me, you could unmute yourself. Which quotation messed you up? Which quotation did you not identify? So I'm still wondering, I was thinking that quotations was more sukim from the Torah. So, I mean, the Amr Mitzvah play is a Maim Chazal. So I guess I didn't quite understand your question. Exactly. Thank you, Hani. I wasn't doing it to, to make it a difficult question, but those will be the quotations that will also mess up your students. Meaning, if it's a normative class from seventh grade up, we have we have, first of all, psukim we're more familiar with. And not only that, but generally we have very nicely. Ne'emar, ne'emar. We have cold words that sort of tell us, hey, she'ne'emar, here it doesn't say that. But we have cold words that identify this is a posuk. From Tanakh, generally a seventh grader can find it. My Mari Chazal are very hard for the student to identify. And my Mari Chazal are generally what a student is not going to see. Once you give them a number, though, when we thrashed it out and they tell me two and I say, good work, there's actually three, they probably know they're going to be looking for something that sounds like a Mari Chazal. And we want to train them and train them and train them in this. Generally, I expect students to really master it when they're in about 11th grade. But we want to start from seventh into the concept of there's also some quotations that aren't going to be so easy to find. Now that we're looking at quotations, let's go to the next step. Why do I care so much about quotations? Well, every time there's a quotation, I need to do something. The learner will identify quotations as proofs or answers. This is a very fundamental piece of teaching a student how to learn a Rashi. Every quotation, if his quotation is a pasuk from Tanakh, as Chani said, if it's a Maimar Chazal, it is a quotation from Onkelos. These are the three areas that Rashi used to prove the Mavdafka. And unfortunately, many students are mistaught or just not taught. And anytime they see a quote, they think, oh, it's a proof, it's a quote. Quote does make proof. Not at all. Quote means a quote. The quote could be a proof, but the quote could be part of the answer. And there's a very simple technique that you're going to teach your students, and they will know, is it a proof? Or is it part of the answer? From what grade can you teach this? From sixth grade. Remember, in sixth grade, you as the teacher are identifying quotations. Once we're identifying quotations, we can train the students to understand, I need to always know about a quote 
Is it a proof, my normal go-to, or is it an answer? How do I do that? It's very simple. Take the quote out. If you remove the quotation, be it from Tanakh, be it Unculus, be it a Maimar Chazal, if you remove the quotation and the answer is intact, you know it was a proof, because the answer still works. If you remove the quotation and the answer doesn't work anymore, this quotation is not a proof. This quotation is part of the answer, and it's something to explain to the students from sixth grade when you're teaching the skill, that Rashi has no need to prove himself. Meaning, unfortunately, we probably were mistaught, or possibly, and we might be misteaching, that we sort of train students to think, question, answer, proof. That's not at all correct. Rashi is a Pashtun. As a Pashtun, Shat is self-validating. He doesn't need to prove it. It shouldn't need a proof. You should plug it in and see it works, and oh, the light bulb goes off, and we're done. Move on. So whenever Rashi actually does prove, we need to do further work and say, well, why did he prove here? I thought he didn't have to prove. But that's a later step. But for now, from sixth grade, your students are going to understand Rashi doesn't need to prove. Rashi generally doesn't prove. And therefore, every quotation, I have to understand, is it a proof or is it the answer? So let's start. All right. So the first thing, obviously, we need to do is ask our students to find the quotation. So please find and underline the quotation in this Rashi. Okay, you don't have to send it up to me, but please for yourself find and underline the quotation. Okay. So the quotation here might have been a little difficult to find because it's a Maimar Chazal. And Maimar Chazal, your screen is not showing a new Rashi. Okay. Do you see the Rashi now? Good. I forgot to do something I was supposed to have done before I started. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, so in this Rashi, the quote is a Maimar Chazal. It's possible because it's a Maimar Chazal, it's harder for your students to find. On the other hand, this Maimar Chazal, Eved Melech Melech, is, I would say, a more famous one. So depending on the grade, I don't think a seventh grade is going to find it, but very possible a stronger ninth or tenth grader will actually find it. And if they don't find it, you'll give it to them. That's okay. Truly until 11th grade, I don't worry if my students can't find my Mari Chazal. I'm just showing it to them and broadening their horizons on my Mari Chazal. But if it's a sixth grade and I showed it to them, or if it's an 11th grade and they found it themselves, we still have the same assignment now. Is this my Mari Chazal a proof or an answer? Please send up to me, think it, and please send up to me for any response. which means you have to learn the Rashi. Apply the technique. Pull out the Maimar Chazal. Is the answer intact? It's a proof. If the answer is not intact, it's part of the answer.
Okay, so I have proof, proof, and answer. And Aviva is correct. It's the answer. Now, how did she know that? Let's try to take it out. If I'm looking at Rashi's answer here, and this is obviously within a long Rashi that at some point in this workshop we're actually going to learn. But for now, it's okay. We didn't learn the whole thing. For my students, this would be much easier because they're more familiar with it. But let's just throw ourselves into the middle of the Rashi. Let's understand this point. The Avdi the Moshe. Hmm, it doesn't say the Avdi Moshe. It says the Avdi and the Moshe. So if he was my Eved and not Moshe, if he was Moshe and not my Eved, in either place, you shouldn't have started up with him. And how much more so that he's my Eved, and the Eved of the king is like a king. So you should have said, the king doesn't love him for nothing, etc. The answer goes on, but that's enough for us to understand it. So if I take out those words, Eved, Melech, Melech, I'm losing here a key point that Rashi is trying to make. What is Rashi making by saying Eved Melech Melech? What's his point in bringing in that Maimar Chazal? Somebody call out. In other words, unmute yourself. Well, ultimately, Moshe is compared to Hashem, exactly. Eved Melech Melech. Look how chashuv he is. Look how vichtik he is. Look how important he is. Because he's the king's servant, he's so special. So if Rashi did not say those words, if I omit those words from the answer, so what if he's his Evid? The Kosha came to Abdi. Okay. If he's the Evid of Medish Abishra, that's pretty special, but I don't know how special. Without saying Evid Melech Melech, I don't understand what's so special about him being an Evid that I shouldn't dare start up. So therefore, I can't take these words out. If I take these words out, the answer loses its punch. It loses its power. Oh, I can't take the words out. It's an answer. So that's always the logic. And the same way I took the time to explain it to you, you would take the time to go through this with your student. Honestly, in my experience, this is a skill they all pick up. The first Rashi, the fifth Rashi, the tenth Rashi, the fifteenth Rashi. Don't worry, there are plenty of Rashi with quotes. They get very good at it because the logic is very pushy and straightforward. If it can stand without it, it's a proof. If it can't, it's got to be the answer. So let's look at another one. All right, so we go through our steps. The first step is I've got to identify the quote. So look at the Rashi and write down for yourself or underline your Chumash, what is the quote here? Okay. I assume that was not hard for you or your students. Not showing the new Rashi. Still the same Rashi. Okay. If my computer is lagging, Please look in your Chumash, Pasuk Yudbeis, in Parak Yudbeis in Bamidbar. The Rashi, Asher B'tseiso Merechem Imo. The quote there, King in Shenemar, Ki Achinu B'sareinu Hu. And I'm asking you on that quote, Ki Achinu B'sareinu Hu, is it A, a proof, or B, an answer? Yes. You still don't see the screen? It's still in change? Oi. Parak Yibbez, Pasad Yibbez of the Midbar. On the words, Asher B'tseso Merechem Imo, there's a Rashi, uh, rather long, about five lines. 
the quote in it, which we identify, Kiachinu Bisareinu Hu. Is Kiachinu Bisareinu Hu a proof or an answer? If it's a proof, send up an A. If it's an answer, send up a B. Or you can just type it out. So this seemed like a super simple one, but actually it's not. <laughs> it's amazing. This is such a short parrot. I, I decided, and I conceptualized this workshop many years ago, to find one parrot that was short. So from the short parrot, I can show you all of these rules. So a person would think, otherwise a person would think, oh, you know, yeah, I'm never going to come across these rules. They're all over the place. So we have in the short parrot a, 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 a deal significant in finding proofs or answers. And it's these words, ke'inyan shene'emar. Ke'inyan shene'emar is one of the codes of Rashi. As we will soon learn, Rashi has embedded in his parish codes, as we all use, every profession has codes, shorthand for concepts. So Rashi has many, some of which are common, some of which are very rare. This is not so common, but it's not so rare. If we did not have the words every single one of you 100% would have been correct, and it is a clear, simple, obvious proof. But, the Rebbe explains, that whenever Rashi says before introducing a quote, he's telling you this is an answer. You think it's a proof, it looks like a proof, but it's actually an answer. You need this quotation to completely understand the answer at hand. So will you find it as, as readily as I did? I don't know. But every once in a while, it does come up. And therefore, for you in your arsenal as a teacher, beware and teach this to your students. And hopefully, there'll be enough times in the year when you have a Ka'inyan Shanamar that by the third time, your students will remember. They won't probably remember by the second, unless it's really close proximity. But by the third, they'll remember. If they don't remember by the third, they'll remember by the fourth. And you've done a good job in teaching them a code. Let's do another one. Ah, I write this out for you. Ke'inyan Shanamar hints that the following quotation is not brought as a proof as would seem, but rather as part of Rashi's explanation. So please remember that for your future learning of Rashi's. Let's do another one. Please send up to me. Is the plus of A a proof, B an answer? If your screen did not shift, we are on Rashi test love. This is the last Rashi in the parent. The Ha'am Lo Nasa.
All right, Rabbi Shapiro is couching himself or changing his mind. Um, proof or answer? This is a proof, as most people saw. How do you figure it out? Exactly the same technique. Hashem is giving her this honor for seven days Kali Yisrael waits for Miriam because one hour, Tiff Seder explains what we mean by one hour, that she waited for Moshe when he was thrown into the Nile. Without that quote, do I understand completely the concept? Yes, I do. I understand that the people did not travel because Hashem is giving her this covered in response to her waiting for Moshe when he was a little baby thrown into the Nile. The nation now waits for her. The quotation doesn't add to my understanding. I understood it. So what's the function of the quotation? Oh, it's a proof. That's the time it's a proof, when I already have the answer intact. If the answer is not intact, then it's an answer. If the answer is completely intact, it's a proof. Okay, so I think you basically got the idea. If you don't have it by now, within two, three weeks of teaching, you will have it because you will find all these quotations that you have to do with your class. Proof or answer, proof or answer, proof or answer. And you just get really good at it really fast. Okay, another step. The learner will identify Rashi repeating an answer. Now, this means an answer Rashi already taught us. From seventh grade, introduce this concept to your students, meaning you, the teacher, identify the answer. Because a seventh grader is not going to be able to do this on their own, but you need to create in them the enduring understanding that whenever Rashi repeats an answer, I have to notice it. Something strange is going on here. We're going to need to understand it. We're going to need to discuss it. I need to note that Rashi is repeating an answer. By the time we come to 10th graders, they should identify it spontaneously. Well, what happens if they don't? If they don't, say to them, there's something we need to discuss in this Rashi. Who can tell me what we need to discuss in the Rashi? And wait. Wait, and then they'll look and think, and what are the issues, and they'll come up with it, hopefully eventually. But by 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, you want your students to identify that Rashi is repeating an answer he already told us. 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, give them that information. And we have, actually twice in this very short parak, Rashi repeating an answer. Can you see my screen? No, okay, no, okay. So this I need to explain to you then because if you can't see the screen, you're not gonna be able to understand what I'm saying. So there's, when you do see it, someone say yes. So I'll know I don't have to talk as much. So I found here in this parak, I'm looking, right? I wanna see if I can find a few Rashi repeating an answer in our parak. So lo and behold, I found twice. Vayatsu shenehem, vayatsu shenehem. We have very clearly this is one that we're probably familiar with. It's a really famous one. Right? And we have here Rashi explaining this whole concept by Nayach that we only say the complete praise of a person not in front of his face. And therefore, and we're using the exact same logic here. Okay, thank you. Someone gave me a trick. Shimona um, Devarai, Eina Elulashan Bakasha. Where here is Rashi repeating his answer? Who remembers? Class, send it up to me in your chat, or you can unmute yourself. Excellent. This Barak! Remember, we've worked with this Rashi already twice. <laughs> we did it in Mitzadaber and we did it in Shimon Adamarai. Now here, make this, here I have a whole thing I did, which 
you might want to do something like this with your class. You might not. It, it depends on if you need to. If they get it as quickly as Hani did, you're good to go. You don't have to put time into it. If they're like confused, it's a little fuzzy in their heads, it's worth taking the time to do something like this because it makes it so simple for the class to cut the concept. Here I have Pasuk Aleph. Here I write Pasuk Vav. Here is the original Dibra Hamaschal Vatsadaber. Notice my star student remember the Dibra Hamaschal. And here in Pasuk Vav, my new Dibra Hamaschal Shimun Adamara. And here I highlighted the exact same concept. Kol no Lashem Bakasha, Eina El Lashem Bakasha. Classical example, six psukim, five psukim later, Rashi's repeating his answer. So definitely, if it's something like this, you want your students to come up with it. Also with Nayach, because when you teach the Rashi, you understand, we've learned this in Nayach. Do we expect them to recognize from other places? We would expect students to recognize, one, something you know they were taught, or two, something very famous, or three, something that was implicit in the Rashi that he already taught it. Meaning, in this situation here, Eina Elosha Makasha, I taught it to them five psukim ago. Yes, I expect them to remember it. <laughs> they were already taught it. In terms of the Noyach Rashi, right, the one previously, Ve'etu Shenehem, that whole second half of the Rashi is a concept that in Noyach we see it says, and only because, so obviously Rashi told it to me in Nayach. He's not originating in Vayetzu Shnehem about Nayach. He taught it in Nayach. He's bringing it in as a raya for what he's doing here. So it's obvious he's repeating his answer. Sometimes, as I said, things are very famous. That Nayach thing also happens to be very famous. It's something most students sort of do remember. I don't know why. It's something that sticks out in their head, a concept. Maybe they also learn in partial class. Like it's something they generally know. If it's something that's not famous, they didn't learn it before. It's not obvious from the Rashi that Rashi's repeating it. No, I wouldn't expect them to note it. But if they're already like a 10th grade class, I would guide them to it. Again, how did I guide them? I said, there's something in this Rashi we need to talk about. I mean, they know the issues we talk about. Is Rashi quoting the Baal Hamaymer? Are there two answers? Is this Rashi out of order? Like, what could the issue be? So this will be something like, oh, well, maybe Rashi's repeating his answer because I see this is a type of answer that could be repeated. Great work. And then maybe let's try to think. Let me try to pull out of their minds or lead them to find it where they said it before. But definitely in those three situations, I know they learned it already. I know it's famous. Or I know it's understood from the Rashi that Rashi already said it. They need to come up with it. And I'm, I'll put the time into them coming up with it because I believe very strongly anything they get from their own brains is much better than anything they get from my brain. Even if I'm guiding them 90% of the way, it's still better that they're coming up with it than I did. Okay, step 13. The, lead, the learner will identify Rasha using la'az, which we normally understand as lashan am zar. In other words, La'az is a contraction, Lashon Amzar, which means Old French, Rashi was in France, within his commentary. La'az also, some explain La'az to mean like from the term Me'am Lo'ez, from a, a foreign nation, not as an acrostic, but actually as a word. From which grade do you do this? From fifth grade. No problem. You teach fifth graders, you start identifying it within the fifth grade year, your students are identifying it. No issues whatsoever. Is it just me? I only have the top half that's changing, and the bottom half still says Shimona Devari of the page. The top half of your screen is working, and the bottom half isn't? Uh, the pages are changing at the top, but the bottom still says Ki Aizcha Reisi Tzadik Afanav. Shem up. Now we got it. Now you have it? Yep. Okay, thank you for telling me. I just took my screen, which I minimized, because someone told me if I minimize it, it would switch faster, and I pushed it up a little on my screen. All right, I really appreciate the feedback. Sometimes if you don't see the screen, it doesn't make a difference. Sometimes it does. All right, Rashi using laws. Notice this is in Parakid Aleph. I didn't find the, any laws in our parak here, but very, very, very easy to identify 
not a big deal at all. And I'm sure you probably already do this with your students. We're just formalizing it a little bit. Step 14. The learner will integrate Rashi codes in understanding Rashi. Sorry, can I interject? Sure. Just something I once learned from a friend of mine. If you know how to spell the word in old French, if you Google it under images, often it will actually give you the picture of what you want. So you tell the kid, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you a translation. If you have a smart board or something like that, it really works well. You Google it with the French word and click images. I did it with reeds when Maisha was in the reeds and the cucumbers it works. They translate based on the picture that Google shows them because Google translates the French for them and it can work really well. That's such a great idea. I really like that. I'm actually gonna write it down. So say it one more time, Connie, so I can write it so, down. So, I mean, I did it with um, Yonk. Rashi translates Suf as Yonk, and it's spelt in French, Jonk, with a J, J-O-N-C. And when you Google it, you have these massive reads. So when you wanna know what, what does Rashi translate Suf as, it's that Moshe was in, these huge, um, like the in the reeds, like it would be on the surface. and they, they didn't have to. I didn't have to translate it to them. I they just saw the pictures on the screen, and they guessed what the picture was showing. Um, I haven't done it with anything else right recently that I remember, but a lot of the words, if you can spell them right, Google is you know good enough that it knows what you're talking about, and if you click images, it will give you a picture. I really like that. The reason why I like that is not only are they, again, any information they can give you is far more priceless than any information you can give them. Remember this for everything you teach, not just homish. You always want the students to be the originators, the generators of information. So you right now are empowering your students to be the generators of the translation instead of absorbing the teacher's brilliance. I like that. Now, what Viva is saying, and this again was the, the, the point, I think Hani may be saying you have to spell it correctly, is that a lot of these words aren't in use today. It's true, I, I, a friend of mine who's, who's from France, I think maybe the French in France is more accurate or more in sync with old French than the French in Montreal, because I do know that coming from France, she does know many of the words, not all of them, but many, it's sort of like, I mean, if you ever had to read like Canterbury Tales and Chaucer or something like that, some of the words have like totally different meaning, but some have remained enough intact over the generations. But I love that idea because I love them coming up with it. And trust me, they will remember that far more than any word you ever translate for them. So that's a great tip. Thank you for sharing it. And I wrote it down. All right. The so learner will integrate Rashi codes in understanding Rashi. So as we were mentioning before, in the Kenyan Shanam Rashi, Rashi has lots of codes. He's it's part of his profession, his mitzaya. Some of the codes are unique to Rashi, and some are in general the codes of learning of Gemara. So if you know more, you have a bit of an advantage there. But these codes, do you teach all of them to your students? Do you make like a list? I actually do have a, a PDF I made that I can share with you, but no. As they come up in the Rashis, that's how you teach them. So from when do you start? From seventh grade. It's not an intellectual issue at all, it's information. So from seventh grade, we definitely can give them examples of codes. Here's just a raw list of all of these terms, which are codes. Now obviously, Kitargumo and the Goimer is very, very, very common. Um, the Amru Rabbaseinu, Rabbaseinu Amru comes up quite frequently. Yin Shanamar, we just saw, and some of them come up very rarely. So in our parak, besides Yin Shanamar, we have a code, right? Right here. Kitargumo. Kitargumo is a legitimate code. It's a code we might all know, but it's worth explaining to your student. They like the concept code, it, like they're in the know, that this is a code. Now, what's the code? Why is it a code? It's Kitargumo. So what would you explain to your students? Why is Kitargumo a code? Why isn't it just a translation of the word Kitargumo? Maybe because we're specifying Unclus as opposed to Targum Yonason or someone else. Exactly, that's exactly the point. And show it to your students inside. 
like, oh wow, there's another Targum? I didn't know Rashi was always favoring one over the other. Hey, what's Rashi doing here? It's like, wow, that's cool. There are two Targums. There are two linears embedded in your homage, if you have a Makros Gedailus. And Rashi ignores one and only focuses on Onkelis. Kitargumu, Onkelis. It's a code. It could mean Yonis and Benazia. So the students probably know Kitargumu is, is Onkelis. But broadening the idea of a code gives them the understanding of the significance of it. Um, now, what is Onkelis doing? What's the function here in this Rashi? This Kitargumo is answering the question of the Rashi. Now, if I'm looking at this Rashi Noalnu, the question obviously is, what does Noalnu mean? And what's my answer? What does Noalnu mean? Kitargumo. Why does he only use Unclis? Um, I don't know, meaning I never saw clearly Rashi uses Unclis over Yonis and ben for whatever reason. I mean, Onkelis definitely embeds within his translation commentary, but honestly, so does Yonis and Benazil. So I'm not sure. I, it might be a little more shot oriented. I believe Onkelis is more shot oriented if I'm thinking of differences between Onkelis and Yonis and Benazil. Much later, towards the end of our steps, we're going to actually see that many times Onkelis is so in sync with Rashi that Onkelis's Taichin, his, his linear, is actually supporting Rashi's answers. So there's an amazing partnership going on between Onkelis, who's obviously written, you know, centuries, centuries before, and Rashi, as we will see quite a number of steps down the road. So if we look here, no, I'll know. What does Rami mean? Kitargumo. So your class says, all right, what does the Targum say? What do you tell your class? What do you tell your class that says to you, so what's the Taich? Hmm. I guess you never had a Rashi. The Rashi said Kitargumo. What would you tell your class now that you never had this before? Let's envision. You come across a Rashi where Rashi says Kitarguma. What do you have to tell your class at this point? Look. Thank you, Aviva. You say, look it up. So being the awesome teacher here, we look it up on the board with our PowerPoint. You do not have to be so prepared. You can have them look it up inside. If they're uncomfortable with it, take the time to do something like this. It takes less time than you think it's going to take you. You know, it's just basically, you know, you, whatever. You can figure out how to do it so it doesn't take as much time as, as it scarily seems to. When they're used to looking it up in Onkelis, you don't have to bother. If they're not used to looking it up in Onkelis, bother to make it not intimidating for them. All right. So I would say in my class, hmm, well, Rashi said Kitagumo, so we need to look it up. Thank you, Aviva. And we look it up. But I don't understand Onkelis. I trust you can find it. Let's go find the word Noel now. I'd like you to find it. Where in the Onkelis is this Taich? And you can find it. And your students will be able to find it because it's partially laid out. You just keep going word for word and you find it. So Noel no, the it Pashna. Okay. I don't know Aramaic, it doesn't help me. I bet you can figure this out. So, if you can send up to me in your chat, what is a shirish of the Targum? Take away all the letters that are, I see a shimush, that are letters for the grammar and find it.
Okay. So almost everyone got testation. Hey, that's a word we know. I'm sure my students have heard of the word tipage. They can figure that out. Now, somebody said, well, she's not sure. And I think I understood the question. The question would be that sometimes in a reflexive word of certain letters, a test could be a grammatical letter. Of course, a noon could also be. So that was sort of vacillating between the two. I assume that was the, the deliberation there. But it's much more common than nun being added for grammatical purposes over the test. So most of your students are going to find that sure test patient. Now, this one was easy. I acknowledge it was easy. They know the Sherish T page, so they can figure it out. Even if it's not, and we couldn't get to this step, and we just got to here, you're still giving them the tools of, I have to look, and I have to find the word in Aramaic, and I have to see if it's something close to a Hebrew word, or if my Aramaic is good enough for me to understand what his uncle is saying. And even if they're not going to know, and even if it's something you're going to tell them, still you're going through, as we keep stressing, the authentic process of learning. If it says Kichagumo, don't look in the teacher's brain, look it up. Okay, here's another example of a super common Rashi code. Vigoymer. Okay, super common. Your students definitely need to know this. It comes up all the time. So what's the code here in the Goymer? Well, in the Goymer, whenever we have the Goymer in a Dibraham Asu, in the title, it means that this Rashi is hinting to explain not just the words of the Dibraham Asu, but the entire rest of the puzzle, or more words in the puzzle. Exactly what the Goymer means, etc. The rest of whatever is being commented on in the Rashi. And we can see this very clearly here. You could actually see it very clearly in any Rashi with the Goymer. Notice this is from Britain, Mishra Yud Aleph. I didn't find the Goymer, Diba Hamasko, and Atarak. So we have a Pasuk. We have a Diba Hamasko. And we have the Rashi. Now, if you are trying to teach your students the rule, the concept, Putting it on a PowerPoint like this, but using the two colors makes it very easy. You don't have to do it. If you know your students are more visual learners, you know it's a little difficult for them to conceptualize, you know it's a little difficult for them to hold information in their head, it might be worth taking your time to do this. If they don't have those limitations, don't bother. But if they do, it's worth it. All right, so the Pasuk says, Shato on the Laktu, Rashi, the Tachlu Berechayim, the Goimer, the Tachlu Berechayim, but he's saying, and etc. Which, by the way, this is a call not just in Rashi and all Limud, the Goimer or the Chume always means you need to look up the rest. The rest is relevant. So here, it's very relevant. So what do I see Rashi doing here? The Tachlu Berechayim, Lo Yerad Berechayim, okay, that's directly explaining that Zebra Hamas fell. Okay, it directly explains the Yeramasko. But Rashi doesn't just say that. Rashi also says, What does that have to do with Tachlan Berechayim? What does that have to do with Tachlan Berechayim? Ah, the Begoyimer. Because if I look in the Pasuk, the Pasuk says, Tachlan Berechayim, O Dachlan Meducha, O Bishlu Beferur. So the Pasuk is not just talking about grinding, it's talking about pulverizing. It's talking about cooking, and so is the Rashi. And again, its tongue was changed when it's tachan, or to pulverize, or to cook. How is Rashi? How does he talk about these other words? So this will come up many, many, many times. Many times. This is a type of rule you teach. Within two weeks, your students will probably know it because it will come up within those two weeks probably three times depending on how many Rashi's you learn in a session and how many times you teach Chumash. It's a common rule. Maybe it'll take them three weeks. Maybe it'll take them four weeks. They will master this rule. And again, you don't have to each time make a PowerPoint and color code it, but do it a few times or point it out a few times or have them underline with their pencil and their Chumash 
which are the words of Rashi commenting on the continuation of the Pasuk, which are the words of Rashi are commenting on our Deba Hamasfil. And they'll see very clearly, oh, the Gaimer is very, very, very significant. Okay, let's do another rule. Step 15, the learner will identify Rashi integrating Unkulis. Now, as we mentioned before, when we're talking about Kitagumo and Unkulis and Rashi's attachment to Unkulis, Rashi uses Unkulis a lot. And from third grade, in my head, the first year you teach Chumash, point it out, point it out, enduring understanding. Look, Rashi's bringing in Unkulis. Look, Rashi is quoting Unkulis. Look, Rashi is directing us to look at Unkulis. And from fifth grade, we're going to take that beyond, and we're going to say to the student, well, how did Rashi derive his answer? From Unkelis. How did Rashi derive his proof? From Unkelis. We're going to have them give it to us, and it's usually very easy to identify in our paragraph we have here. Very, very straightforward. Okay. So now we're up to doing something very exciting in our teaching of Rashi. We are now ready to find out what Rashi's answer is. Now note, and I did this very deliberately when I teach, I did not yet tell my students Rashi's answer. We have to wait all the way to step 16 for the learner to formulate Rashi's answer. And that's very deliberate. I've noticed, I imagine my students are the only ones, once they have the answer written down in their notes, it's like, okay, brain shut down, I got my answer, done, finished. So therefore, until we really work through the basics of what's written in that Rashi, I'm not asking them what's Rashi's answer, and I'm definitely not telling them what's Rashi's answer. I want them first to have their minds open and learning all these nuances in the Rashi, and now let's pull it all together and tell me what is Rashi's answer. So obviously, what class do you do this in? Every single class from third grade. And as I have, my model teacher was Rashi's answer and my model student giving Rashi's answer. But my model student couldn't give that Rashi's answer until we did a lot of other things first with the Rashi. So obviously that's not a chiddush and obviously you all ask your students what's Rashi's answer. The point I'm making here is don't waste that powerful question too early. Hold off until you've done all these other steps first and then ask what's Rashi's question. So their minds are still open to like understanding and you have a more attentive audience. All right. The learner will have an enduring understanding that Rashi is Pshat. This is very, 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 very fundamental for our complete understanding of Rashi is that he is, he is a Pashtun. He has a paradigm. He has a box. His box is Pshat. And many, many things he does is because he's in a box called Pshat. Where do I emphasize this to my students? With every Rashi. From what grade? From third grade. From third grade, I want my students to have, as we call it, an enduring understanding. Rashi's a Pashtun. And wherever Rashi's doing something different because he's a Pashtun, we emphasize the point. Oh, how come Rashi had to write it like that? Because he's a Pashtun. Why did he give us this answer, not this answer? Because he's a Pashtun. Why did he rank his answers in this order? Because he's a Pashtun. It should be something just drilled into their heads because we have to get the prism of understanding Rashi as is his prism, that he's a Pashtun. So an example of where we could emphasize this is in a Rashi like this. Now again, this is not the only in a Rashi like this, I mention it. Anytime I have an opportunity, I mention it. I'm just saying some Rashis more lend themselves to emphasizing the point, Rashi's a Pashtun. So if I look here, I will, I'm utilizing this Rashi. I'm exploiting this Rashi to bring out this point. Because what I have here is seemingly something that's not shot. Ha'isha Kushis, we've seen this Rashi before in this workshop. Magid shakol modim biafyeha. Yeshem shakol modim b'shakrusa shakushi. That doesn't sound like shock at all. Ha'isha kushis, this means she's beautiful because just as kushi is overtly black, her beauty was overt. That doesn't sound very pshat like. But it has to be. 
Why does it have to be class? Because Rashi's a Pashtun. Great. I knew you knew it. So what do we call this? We call this Drash Me'em Shach. Where Rashi is taking what definitely seems like a very Drash-like answer. Black, alert, her beauty was alert. And Rashi is telling you. How do we know? Because he's telling you. If Rashi's allowed to quote it, it has to be pshat. Because if it wasn't pshat, he wouldn't be allowed to quote it. So anytime Rashi quotes a drash, this means Rashi is saying this drash has become part of the pshat meaning of the pasuk. Which is why sometimes you might find, happens every once in a while, that Rashi will tell you, yesh midrash yagad the rabbim. And he won't tell you any of them. He'll say there's lots of Midrashim on it. Like, go look it up. Why is he telling it to me? Because Rashi knows your question. It's a great question. And Rashi knows an answer. He's got loads of great answers for you. But he can't give them to you. Because all those answers are Midrashim. No way is it a Pshat. So if it's not Pshat, Rashi says, I can't say it. I wish I could tell you. I'm not allowed to. I'm a Pashtun. Look it up and you'll find good answers. But I can't tell you them. If Rashi is telling me them, this has become part of the pshat. So exactly in such a Rashi, which seems far from pshat, is where you emphasize to the class, Rashi is a Pashtun. This is the pshat of the Pasuk. The pshat of the word kushis is, according to this Rashi, overt. That is the pshat of the Pasuk. Because Rashi is a Pashtun and he's quoting it. In other words, and again, to emphasize this more to the class, I would say, what would I think is the pshat of kushis? Like, before we learn the time. Kushis, black. Kushis from kush. Okay. Let's look what Rashi thinks is the pshat, meaning of kushis. And then after we finish the Rashi, I would say to the class, so according to Rashi, what is the pshat, meaning of kushis? And the answer I would want from the class is overt. That has become the pshat, meaning based on this drash main shot. Um, we're gonna do one more. The learner will identify Rashi integrating the soul. Okay, now this has a few stages in terms of how you teach this, because there's a number of components whenever Rashi utilizes the soul. From fourth grade, I honestly don't know who's teaching what grade. So I'm sort of going through the gamut, and if you teach a number of grades, good. If for some reason I'm not touching on your grade, let me know. From fourth grade, the teacher will point out, oh, Rashi's integrating the surah. Again, we just said Rashi's a Pashtun, Rashi's a Pashtun, Rashi's a Pashtun. But sometimes the Pashtun integrates Masaira if he needs it for the chat. So from fourth grade, you point this out. From sixth grade already, your students can identify it because Masaira is very obvious. The basic Masaira that Rashi uses is truck. Sometimes he uses truck, that's Masaira. Kriyuksiv, Kriyuksiv he sometimes uses, that's Masaira. Malay Chaser, Malay Chaser is Masaira. Nikud on the words. If Rashi ever points out Nikud on the word, that's Masaira. Um, those are basically the four I found. I'll repeat them one more time in case you're not familiar with the concept, because as teachers you have to be masters of this. Shruk. Kriyuksiv, Malay Chaser, and Nikud on the Oisius. Those are four techniques of Masaira that Rashi occasionally uses. Every time they're Masaira, Rashi the Pashtun is integrating Masaira. Since there are only four and they're very obvious, that's why I'm saying that if since fourth grade students were shown by the teacher, oh, this is Masaira, it's Malay Chaser, oh, this is Masaira, Kriyuksiv, oh, this is Masaira, Rashi's integrating truck. So by the time two years later, they're in sixth grade, they can identify them. By seventh grade, you teach your student whenever Rashi is using Masaira, Rashi writes his question. So now we're adding a level in their understanding of Masaira. Now let's look for it. How do I explain Masaira? What I would explain to the students is that Masaira means part of the Torah Shabbat that's not written within the Torah Shabbat 
but it's fundamental to understanding the Torah Shebechsav, and it's Torah Lomayisha Misinai, meaning it's not something that we, that our sages deduced with their minds, it's something that goes back to Maishan Har Sinai. So all of these ideas are Torah Lomayisha Misinai. That's Masaira. Now, there are other techniques of Masaira besides the one I mentioned, but these are the four. I, I, I mean, if anyone can think of anything else that Rashi uses, let me know. But when I, I've thought about it, these are the four I see that Rashi uses generally. Um, and again, all four of them are not something that we figured out intellectually, that our Hachamim figured out intellectually. It's Masaira. Masaira means the transmittance right? The knowledge that was transmitted midar ladar, going all the way back to my Shev and Maimon Har Sinai. So now, now my class are seventh graders, so they can easily identify the Masaira. I mean, they've been doing this for three years, but now I'm telling them, look for Rashi's question. Rashi's going to write a question. Whenever, now they don't know why. They don't have to know why. They're seventh graders. It's fine. Whenever Rashi uses Masaira, he writes a question. Let's find the question. When we're in eighth grade, I'm going to explain to them why does Rashi always write a question whenever he brings in Misaira? Because it's not his real question. This question he's writing is not his real question. And now I tell my class, how do we know it's not his real question? You can send it up to me in your chat or you can unmute yourself. How do I know that that Messiah question, why is the truck this way? Why is it written Malay or Chaser? Why is there Nekudus over the Isis? How do I know that's not Rashi's real question? No. Think of what we spoke about Rashi, because it's not Pshat. Thank you, Aviva. Because Rashi is a Pashtun. So how could Rashi, as a Pashtun, be wondering about a Kriyuk Sim? It's not his gather. It's got nothing to do with him. How could Rashi, as a Pashtun, be wondering about Moli or Chaser? It's not his problem. It's not his issue. This is Masoira, and he's a Pashtun. Masoira is not Pshat. So whenever Rashi is using Masoira, he's like, borrowing the Saira to answer a Pshat question. And therefore, because the Ben Hamish Lamikra isn't thinking about the Saira, we're learning Chumash, we're, we're in the frame of mind of Pshat, he wouldn't be noticing if it's Mali or Chaser. He's not noticing if there's Nakudas over the ICS. It's not his issue. It's got nothing to do with him. So therefore, Rashi always has to write it. In other words, Rashi is sort again, there's sort of like an implicit understanding between Rashi and the Ben Chamesh Lamikra. The Ben Chamesh Lamikra has a problem, and Rashi's responding. The Ben Chamesh Lamikra wonders about something else, and Rashi's responding. That's why Rashi does not write his questions. I mean, it's your question. You know the question. I'm producing the answer. Just sometimes as teachers, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone who's been teaching for a few years has experienced this. You're teaching something, your student looks a little confused, and you know exactly what's bothering her. So you just smoothly answer it, and then you see that express in her eyes like, oh. Um, right, right. If the letter is larger or smaller, that is Masaira. Does Rashi comment on that? Yes, he does, 100%, thank you. That's another great example. And that's also completely Masaira. We're not putting logic into it. That's called Masaira. So Rashi, as a Pashtun, knows you're not worrying why the letter is larger or smaller than the normal size. You're not worrying why there are dots over the letter. You're not worrying about a Kriyuk It's got nothing to do with you. You're a student. You're studying Pshat. So therefore, Rashi has to write the question because you're not thinking about it at all. But why is he going into this question? To deal with your real issue, which is a pshat problem. I'm gonna give you an example, not from our parak, we didn't have one in our parak. 
I'm not going to explain the whole concept now. We will learn this later as we progress in our understanding of these ideas. Is Nikud Pshat, sorry, I just noticed. Nikud over the ICS, no, it's completely Masaira, meaning Tarlu Vashim Misina, sometimes there's dots over letters. That's not Pshat at all, that's 100% Masaira. So, this is in Paragimel. At least I stuck with paper, but my phone. Okay, so we have here. Can you see the screen? The new screen? Great, because this is not in our parak. I would have to direct you to a previous parak. Okay, good. So if we look here at the Rashi, Asher Pakad Maisha Aharon, what is Rashi writing as his question? Please send up to me. What is Rashi writing as his question? Okay, for the benefit of time management, I'll take Aviva. Thank you. Nakud al the Aharon. Why are there Nakudos over the word Aharon? That's what he's writing as his question. Now, that's not a shot question. Nikud al the Isis is complete Masangra. Read the Psukim. Yudala Tesvav Tesayin and Lama Tes, which is our Pasuk here. And based on the Psukim, please send up to me what's the real question here. What's the question that's bothering the Ben Chamesh Lamikra? Read the Psukim, Yudal, Tesvav, Tesayin, and then Lama Tes, and then tell me what is bothering the Ben Chamesh Lamikra? Great, okay? So I got two people, I'm satisfied. <laughs> if you read the Psukim, it's very obvious. And something like this, I got my third, thank you. Excellent, my fourth. You see how it jumps at you if you read the Psukim? Remember, this goes back to our technique. We look at the Psukim to create the question. So in our Pasuk here, it says, all the countings of the Levim that Moshe and Aaron counted. But if I go back to the T-boy, Hashem tells Moshe, the Kodesh B'nai Levi. Aaron's not mentioned. And in the next Pasuk, by Yifkodos and Moshe. Aaron's not mentioned. And suddenly here in Lamatez, I'm Aaron shining in. I'm giving him this credit. So, and again, a beautiful example to show my students. One person expressed it as Moshe counted not Aaron. Another one expressed says, first Moshe counts, and it says they both counted. Another one said, Hashem instructed Moshe to count, now it says they both counted. Another one said, where does Aaron come in? And we're all saying the same thing. I love that. You can all express it in your own words. You're all correct. Great thinking. So that's my obvious shot question. Rashi is incorporating the Sunra to answer my shot question. Because Rashi, the Pashtun, is using the idea of Nikud on the Isis, and I will explain this more when we understand these rules better, which we're going to get to in step 29. This is step 18, so not so far away. That through the Nikud on the Isis, we actually delete the whole word. So the Nikud on the Isis, Misoira, is answering my Pshat question. 
And that's why Rashi, the Pashtun, is integrating Masaira. But since he's a Pashtun and you're not thinking along those lines, he writes out his question. Okay. We race through a lot of techniques today. A lot of them, they're straightforward. They come up often enough. And I sincerely hope over the next week of teaching Chumash, you'll utilize these principles, as well as the ones from the week before, as well as the ones from the week before. When I prepare Chumash, I keep my, um, my book. What you all got emailed, my basic steps. And I literally, I mean, I, I know it fairly well, but I literally still cross-check myself as I'm teaching the Rashi. Does it have this issue? Does this have issue? Does this have this issue? So I make sure whenever there are those issues, I can utilize them and give my students the skills and the tools and the ownership of Rashi. So good Shabbos. I hope you'll utilize these skills over the week and Amir Tzashem will progress even more Amir Tzashem in a week.